Nathan, appreciate that this evening. All right, you know where to turn, right? Acts chapter 28. And uh, boy, I tell you, I don't, I didn't look back. Sometimes I look back and see when we started these series. I was afraid to look back and figure out when we started these because uh, it's been a while, I think. Uh, but praise the Lord. Uh, not wearing a jacket tonight. Don't throw tomatoes at me. Mrs. Perkins conveniently brought them in for you. So <laughs> told her, everybody show me your hands. Let me show you. Okay, <laughs> just kidding. So, uh, praise the Lord tonight. Acts chapter twenty-eight. All right, I brought some um, uh, maps again, and also some pictures. Um, and I, I'm excited about uh, just the uh, not only the history of this, uh, but as I was um, uh, one refreshing thing to me. Um, my daughter came to me today, and Anna. She said, "Dad, I've been reading in Acts, waiting when Paul gets to see Nero or Caesar." And uh, I got to the end of Acts, and he didn't see him. I'm so disappointed. What happened to him? And so I'm going to address that tonight. I told her, I said, I've learned some great and very interesting things. She said, tell them to me. I said, you'll have to come tonight. So she's, she didn't get any privileged information. Uh, but uh, I'm, I, um, I think tonight, as we close this, the, the way it's closed is very fitting for the purpose of the book of Acts. I'll say that. Let's, let's uh, ask the Lord's blessing on our time together, and then we'll read and go through some of these thoughts tonight. Shall we pray? Lord, we come before you tonight in this last installment of this series. Lord, we've waded our way through the book of Acts, and it's been exciting. There's been a lot of truth and a lot of learning. And uh, Lord, I feel really another connection of understanding having gone through this study, and I pray that that might be the case with uh, others as well. May it, Lord, have a breath of life that is uh, very real to us, I pray. And tonight, may it be no different. Holy Spirit, we pray as we uncover the Word of God that you would uh, truly speak in our hearts and help us to understand, uh, Lord, and appreciate what uh, we have in the Word of God. Thank you for the advance of the gospel from that time in, at Pentecost and on through, Lord, to the first end of the first century. And Lord, how it just exploded during that first century. I pray that you would help us to be faithful in the Word of God as we study it and understand it tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, to bring us up to speed, last week we talked about the shipwreck of the Apostle Paul. I'm sensing that there's some problems over in our media. Uh, that's okay, so we'll get there. You guys take your time. We're, we're, not, we're not waiting on you. It's okay. So, uh, last week we talked about Paul and he left Caesarea. If you remember, he went from Caesarea and um, they went up the coast a little bit farther and then they took off across the Mediterranean Sea and uh, went north of Crete and then they came down. And uh, as they were coming down, they went uh, on the island there. And um, the name of it is skipping my mind. Let me turn back to my map here. The Bible says there in chapter 27. Um, Yes, okay, we're getting there. Hold on a second. Pastor should know these things, shouldn't he? Okay, so Crete is the one. Cyprus is what they went north of. I said that wrong. Okay, so Cyprus. Uh, can you go to the map, first of all, that's of uh, Paul's missionary journey? We'll go to that one first, if it's there. Is that there? We just deleted it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, guys. <laughs> no problem. Okay, so... Um, most of you have it in your Bibles anyway, right? <laughs> Poor Nathan's worth about what I pay him, so no. No, 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 no. That's terrible, terrible, Nathan. I, I really do appreciate it all. Okay. Poor pastor's kids. They get so picked on, don't they? Okay, so the, he went over top of Cyprus. They went to Crete, and there was a, they were going to winter there. There was a place called the Fair Havens, if you remember that. And that was not a good place to winter Nobody wanted to do that. And so what they did was they ended up taking off. Paul told them, listen, this isn't going to work. It's, it's going to be a bad deal. We're all going to be in trouble. And they said, no, we're going to do it anyway. We're going to go. And so what happened is they left. And you know what happened for the next 14 days? They were in a terrible storm, a nor'easter, we learned last week. And that, that caused them to lose, really, course. It caused them to lose hope. Uh, they could not really face 
uh, they couldn't do anything. They did everything they knew to do. They strengthened the ship. They lightened the ship. Uh, they, when they got close enough, they realized they were coming to land. They put the anchors down. Uh, then when they realized they could get into land, they lifted the anchors up and, you know, uh, the, folks, the boat stuck fast and uh, the back end was all destroyed and people were trying to leave and all that. How many souls were on board the, the ship? Do you remember? 276. That's right. Good. Amen. So um, that's one of those rare facts of Bible trivia that you'll be able to win a game sometime knowing, all right? And it, it'll be great. All right, so 276 souls. Paul said no one will be lost if you, ever, if you stay on the ship. If you get off the ship, you're going to be lost. And some of them were able to swim to shore. Some of them had to hold on to their, you know, parts of the ship that were all broken up. But all of them made it safely, the Bible says in that last verse of chapter 27. Everybody made it safely. And it's amazing. Now, where they landed was this uh, little island, they figured it out, I'll read this in a little bit, but they landed on this little island called Malta, in the Bible it's called Melita, all right, same thing. And so uh, Malta was this tiny little island, can we go to the next map that, that goes in closer to Malta? All right, here we go, and so here we have the island of Malta, right now, the facts, I don't know, it doesn't really matter too much, but uh, there's about 23,000 people on Malta right now, and uh, it's not very high. During, during this time when there's a lot of people that come in, it swells up to about 60,000. All right, that's today. So uh, this is really the, it's an interesting um, uh, place, but you'll notice here they have a, a, a section. It's actually one of the, one of the regions or districts that call, that's called, do you see that? St. Paul's Bay, all right? Now, that's today. This is a modern map. Uh, but they do have a, sh they, they do have a, a memorial of where Paul came ashore there, traditionally, I don't think they would, you know, nobody knows exactly probably right now, but traditionally they've got a memorial. Matter of fact, a church is built right there. Uh, it's called the, uh, the, the Shipwreck of St. Paul's Church or something like that. It's a very obscure name, right? So um, anyway, that's, that's Malta where they came. Now, there's some interesting things that happened here. I want to take you through that. Let's start reading in verse number one. The Bible says there in verse number one, <clears throat> when they were escaped, that is, from the ship, then they knew that the island was called Melita. All right, and if you have a, a Bible there that has any kind of notes, you'll see that that Melita is the same as Malta there. Verse 2, when the barbarous, or literally the nationals, okay, it's, it's not meaning that they were like chest-beating, you know, cave dwellers. They were, they were these are just the, the island people, the people of that island, the nationals, um, there, when the barbarous people showed us no little kindness, right? There's another way of saying very generous people. They were uh, unusually kind to, to Paul and to those people that landed. And notice it says they kindled a fire. This was their kindness and received us, everyone, because of the present rain. All right. So Euroclide in this nor'easter was still hammering the island. And because of the cold, if you remember, it was getting on to winter time. And that's why they were going to stay, Paul wanted to stay in Fair Havens to overwinter, but they, they couldn't. So this is coming on to the cold. When Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. When the barbarians saw the venomous beast or that creature, uh, again, the word beast has a very negative connotation in our mind. Western minds, I'm not sure our, our vocabulary just took that on, but a beast Simply another way name for a creature, an animal. But that's what the word is here. Notice, it, uh, they saw it hang on his hand. They said among themselves, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom though he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance or justice allows, suffers him not to live. That sounds like a very superstitious group of people, doesn't it? Oh, I see. You must be the bad guy. Karma, right? In other words, you, you're the one that got what you deserved. You got out of the sea, you thought you'd cheated death, but aha, I caught up to you, didn't it? Ah, okay, we know who you are. Now that's something we gotta be very careful of. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but Christians, don't be superstitious. You say, well, I'm not superstitious. Sometimes we are. Sometimes we believe that things happen to us unreasonably, when there's no cause or no effect, no reason. And I, I, we've gotta be very careful about that. Uh, one thing that I, I think we fall into, and I'm not saying it's necessarily wrong when we when we bring God into it, but sometimes, you know, we'll get into a situation where we're delayed or we have something bad happen to us 
And, and we can almost become superstitious in saying, you know, well, God must have preserved me from something bad. Or if something bad happens to us, we say, well, I must not have done that right. Now, God can correct us. And if the Holy Spirit's correcting us, you ought to obey that. But never judge someone else on that. And, and don't go overboard on being superstitious in that way. And it's just a good reminder uh, as we look at this. And when the uh, verse five, when he, he shook the beast into the fire. Now, isn't that just like Paul, right? I mean, I can imagine, you know, something jumps out and he's latched onto the hand. I can just say, thing, ow, you know, and he kind of flings that thing off or I don't know how he did it, but he just, I can imagine it hurt even worse, but, or whatever, but he flung that thing into the fire and um, notice the, the Bible says there, he felt no harm. And literally uh, he, he didn't, it didn't hurt by his testimony, you know, I'm sure he's standing around talking, everybody's looking at him. Howbeit, when they looked, um, they looked when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly, but after that, they looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, and they changed their minds and said that he was a god. There's a couple of humorous things about this, right? First of all, here's everybody around the fire. You can imagine Paul getting latched on. Oh, that's a venomous beast. Yeah, a venomous snake. Oh, man. Shakes into the fire. Oh, that guy's a dead guy, you know. And to me, it's just hilarious. Maybe there's nothing they could do. But they just sat around looking at him. He should be dropping dead any minute now, you know. He should be swallowing. Now, I, maybe they didn't have anything to do. You get, you get bit. That was it back then. I don't know. But, I mean, there's no first aid. There's no, you know, try, not, nothing. Not trying anything. And so they, they're finally looking at him. He's like, man, he should be dead right now, you know. And then it goes on and on and on. It might be a couple hours go by. Wow, this guy's not a murderer. He must be a god. So you see that kind of superstition, the instability of, of understanding and belief that often comes when there's no, there's no truth to it. And so uh, very interesting and comical to me. Verse 7, in the same quarters were possessions of the chief man of the island. Now, this is the guy who's the uh, Roman uh, proconsul, whatever you want to say, the, the leader here, the minister in this area. And his name was Publius, who received us and lodged us, lodged us three days courteously. In other words, here's the main guy of the ship, or the, excuse me, of the land, and he comes in and says, you know, you can come into my house. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? And here's Paul and... Um, he, they were treated well. But anyway, it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and of a bloody flux, to whom Paul entered in to his room and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. Now, God's already establishing a testimony here. Can I remind you that God used the signs to be able to establish and authenticate truth? Paul wasn't doing this to elevate himself. He was doing it so that people could hear the gospel and understand. And that's what God was showing them through this miracle uh, that Paul was, was performing. Now, it's interesting because it says he laid his hands on him and healed him. But verse number nine says, when this was done, others also, which had diseases in the island, came and were healed. Now, I want to just point out, this is probably a little bit advanced, but can I just tell you tonight that the phrase that they were healed was different than the phrase in verse number seven, where the Bible says he healed him. All right. Now, what I'm saying to you is this. I don't know that Paul had a big healing service. All right. What could have happened was Paul healed Publius's dad of this disease that he had that was going to kill him. Others heard that this man got healed, and so they came. And what may have happened, I'm not trying to take away from the miracle if there was, but what may have happened, the word is a little different here, that remember who was with Paul right now writing? Dr. Luke. It's possible that they took a, or had maybe a clinic, impromptu clinic, and, and people brought the, the needy to them and, and Luke was able to treat them or whatever the case might be. Now, I, again, I'm not taking away if there was a miracle here, praise the Lord. We know that there was a miracle with Publius's father, but the fact is that, that they might have taken the model that many missionaries do today, and that is let's treat the physical needs of people and then deal with their spiritual needs. Now, you can't treat the physical and not deal with the spiritual, but if you do try to deal with the spiritual and not the physical, many times you're not successful because that's the first need. And so there's a very interesting concept here in chapter number uh, 28 that may, uh, that may warrant some thought and study 
in the future, but I believe there's some, uh, there's some evidence there. And notice the verse number 10, whom also honored us with many honors, and when we were departed, they laded us with such things as were necessary. And after three months, we departed in a ship of Alexandria, which had wintered in the isle, whose sign was Castor and Pollux. Now, literally, what happened was then, for three months, they stayed in Malta, and uh, just, I believe, evangelizing. Paul was evangelizing. He was preaching. He was teaching. Uh, they were all there doing what God wanted them to do. Isn't that something? Now, obviously, the other people of the ship who were probably criminals at that time, they weren't involved in this stuff, but God gave Paul and his team a really open door on this island. And it's possible, it's very likely, that that established really the, the foundation of Christianity in Malta. And if you go back and study uh, the history of Malta, it's very possible, and, and I think probable, that that's where the, the gospel was introduced to Malta at that time with the Apostle Paul. Now, a little bit of interesting facts. Uh, can we go, Brother Ethan, out to that uh, wide, uh, go back, no, the other one. There we go. All right, so just a little bit of interesting geography here. Of course, we support the Hamiltons that are in Catania, and Pastor and Mrs. Royalty were in Catania in March. Um, and uh, we're gonna bring up Syracuse in just a minute, all right, because Paul goes there next. But uh, the Hamiltons had just gotten back from a couple days down in Malta. It cost them about $25 to fly from Catania down to Malta and spend a couple days down there. So it's uh, very interesting how all of that works together. According to him, it's a, it's a, whole, it's a different culture. It's, not, it's, it's Mediterranean, but it's not Italian. It's very interesting. So uh, Malta is a very unique uh, little, little town there. A lot of people come, or excuse me, a little country, but a lot of people come there. But I'm just saying that God gave that, even that country, even that little, little country that seems insignificant, he gave him, them a chance to hear the gospel. Isn't that something? And uh, I think that's just the love of God, to blow Eura Clyden in there, throw Paul into the water for a little bit with the other people so that these people can hear the gospel. And uh, boy, it was with power, wasn't it? I mean, you're talking about a man who was bit by a viper uh, poisonous snake, healing you know, someone who was gonna die, helping others who were sick, uh, to be healed. I'm telling you, this was power, and God, I believe, did a great work there in Malta while Paul was there. So again, here's what I'm saying to you. Sometimes when our path doesn't seem like it's the way that it ought to go, uh, Paul wasn't planning to go to Malta. Uh, none of the, the ship was, but God blew them there, right? It was very obvious that that's what God was doing, and God used it in a tremendous way. Sometimes our life doesn't look like what we plan. And our ministry may look a little different. Our life may look a little different. But the question is, what can God do with you right there where you are? That's the, prop, that's the, that's the key. All right. Um, continuing on. Um, they departed the ship in Alexandria. Okay, so I, I mentioned about the sign. The sign there is the figurehead. Oftentimes, ships had those figureheads at the front, and that was kind of their call sign. Nowadays, we put big letters on the sides, that, how they identify them. But back in those days, the, the figurehead at the front often identified the ship. So when you're looking through your big scope there, and you see, oh, yes, Castor and Pollux, we know what that, what that ship is. Castor and Pollux is off, uh, obviously the, the sons of the god Zeus, and it was just carved figureheads on the front of this boat, the ship that they would use it. And it was on its way, um, the Bible says, uh, uh, there in verse number uh, 11, it was a ship of Alexandria, so it was coming up from Egypt. If you, I don't, I don't think it shows it in here, but down here, this would be the north coast of Africa, all right? So Alexandria, Egypt would be right on the coast. I'm not exactly sure where, uh, but it'd be down here. And so the, oh, it's over that way farther? Okay, so anyway, somewhere over here is, that, is, is Alexandria, Egypt. The ship had come up to Malta, and it was on its way north. And so they said, you know what, we're just going to hop on this ship, and we're going to go after they'd wintered there a couple months. And notice the ver verse number 13, and from thence we fetched a compass, or in other words, a direction, and came to Regium, all right? And after one day in Regium, the south wind blew, and we came the next day to Puteoli. All right, now, this is very interesting because I don't have it on here, uh, and we erased the, the one that it's on, so we'll just keep going here. All right, so this is all right. So right here in the tip of the shoe of this is Italy, right? Here's the heel, 
and uh, here's the tip of the boot right here. So right here is a little, is a place called, uh, right now it's called Reggio something, I can't remember, but this Regium is where they, they landed. So they came up, um, I skipped one. I skipped Syracuse, where are we at here? Here we go, 12. And landing at Syracuse, we tarried there three days, and from thence fetched a compass. All right, so I skipped that one, sorry about that. So they came up to Syracuse, and then they went up to, to this Regium, and then there was a good wind blowing, a south wind, so they went through this little strait here, which is only about a mile wide, and uh, they went all the way up, and they came to a little place just about where Naples is today, and uh, there's, a, there's that uh, Puteoli, which is where they stopped initially then on the, on the mainland uh, for some significant time. This was only for a day there at that time. But I want to go back to Syracuse real quick because there's some interesting things about that that I'd like to talk about. Uh, we had the privilege of going down to Syracuse for a couple days while we were on the island of Sicily. And I, this is not a tourist thing, but I want to show you a couple things what Paul might have seen. Because it's very interesting that as we go, uh, can you give me that uh, map that's blown in a little, or uh, zoomed in a little bit? on Sicily. Okay, so here is, here is uh, right here is where Syracuse is, all right? So we've zoomed in on Sicily on this far um, eastern side, and there's a, it's quite possible, and again, we were able to see some of this, but it's quite possible that Paul came into this little uh, place here, the ship came in, and there's a, there's a pretty significant port right here, and uh, this little island of Ortigia, but that, that place there is a significant port. Even to this day, there are big ships that come in there, sailing vessels and, and fishing vessels. Uh, let's go to that one picture, I think, of the, of the ships. Um, maybe you could see that on there, Mr. Ethan. All right, so this is kind of what it looks like. Well, this is Mrs. Royalty and I standing on the, on the shore there, and, and ships would come in um, to this place. And as a matter of fact, the, there is a place that commemorates the Apostle Paul. Tradition tells us, the Bible doesn't tell us, but tradition tells us that Paul, during those time, three days that he was on Syracuse, he found believers there and actually preached in the catacombs in Sicily. And they have the catacombs you can go into. They were closed when we were there, so we couldn't go in there. But it's very fascinating to see some of those. Can you go to the other pictures real quick? We'll just glance through some of the things that he might have seen. This, this church was probably... Um, not there, but it's very, very old. Go to the next one. Uh, some of these great big courtyards are very beautiful at night, but they're just, you know, this is the kind of thing that, that the, the buildings are very close. Things Paul might have seen as he was walking through Syracuse. Uh, and I don't know how he got through, but obviously he had a lot of freedom and so forth. And then the next one, uh, this is overlooking the, that bay where I was pointing out before. And uh, just very, very interesting there. So if you could go back to the map now, Brother Ethan. He's doing a good job, by the way. I threw this on him last minute. All right, so anyway, that's, that's kind of what he, Paul might have seen. And uh, this Neapolis Archaeological Park is where they believe that Paul might have done it. Again, tradition just tells us there's not a whole lot in the Bible. And I'll talk about why there's not a lot in the Bible in just a minute, okay? So fascinating about the, the fact, it's very interesting to be standing on that, seat, that dock or that pier and thinking, you know, Paul could have been right here. Isn't that interesting? And it's just amazing. It just shifts your focus and everything about that. It's, it's not sacred, but it's just maybe, it's really neat. As a little bit of a side note, does anybody else know who uh, came from Syracuse that was very famous? Scientific mathematician? Archimedes, very good. So Syracuse is Archimedes' hometown, all right? And they have a statue of him there as well. All right, so let's go on. We're going to continue reading here. Verse number, um, verse 14. Notice in, in Puteoli, they found, verse 14, brethren and were desired to carry, or tarry with them seven days, and so we went to Rome. So it's very interesting that in this Puteoli where they were up there, the brethren heard they found the brethren that were there. Isn't that something? And so they found Christians that were there, and the Christians were like, man, this is great, you know, whatever, and stay here, stay a week with us. Now, isn't that something? Now, I don't know at this time whether Paul was with all of these other people. I'm thinking probably the number of 276 had decreased significantly at this point, whether it was just Paul and Luke with the soldier or with a couple others, I don't know. But whoever it was, they had freedom to stay there an extra week and fellowship with these Christians that were there on the mainland of Italy 
And it's just fascinating to me that number one, there were already Christians there, and number two, that they desired so quickly to connect, and Paul was able to really connect with them. It, it shows me again what we know is true, and that is that, that when we are saved, it doesn't matter our nationality or even our language, although at this time I believe they were all speaking uh, the, the Greek language, but the fact is they were, they were very well connected. Why? The same Spirit, the same Savior, the same Lord. And it's a, b- a wonderful testimony of this as we look at it. Verse number 15, From thence we, when the brethren heard of us, they came to meet us as far as Appy Forum and the three taverns, or the three inns, whom when Paul saw... He thanked God and took courage. Now, this is in great contrast to what I'm going to end with tonight. But listen, Paul, his presence there began to stir up the Christians in that area. And people would come, and they would come from great distances to see him, and actually followed him, went with him up farther north. I don't have the the map tonight, but if we had the map that was deleted... We would see that it was farther north, and as they came, uh, the three taverns and the API, uh, API, API way forum, whatever, I don't know how to say it exactly, but it's getting close to Rome. And that's where these Christians followed them. They went with Paul up with them. Isn't that encouraging? Paul said, listen, I'm thank the Lord. I'm encouraged. This is tremendous. And it just lifted Paul's spirit in his heart to have these Christians along with him for this time. Now, things are going to change here. That's Paul's journey to Rome. But let's talk about now while he's there, and this will close it out. Look at verse 16. When we came to Rome, look at that, just like that. That that sentence tells it all, doesn't it? When we came to Rome, there they are. And verse number 16, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard, but Paul was suffered or allowed to dwell by himself with a soldier that kept him. Now, isn't this interesting? It tells us again that Paul had treatment that was far different than the other prisoners, and Paul now was by himself in a home. It came to pass that after three days, Paul called the chief of the Jews together. And when they were come together, he said unto them, Men and brethren, though I have committed nothing against the people or customs of our fathers, yet was I delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans, who when they had examined me would have let me go because there was no cause of death in me. But when the Jews spake against it, I was constrained to appeal unto Caesar, not that I have aught to accuse my nation of. For this cause, therefore, I called you to see you and to speak with you, because that for the hope of Israel I am bound with this chain. And they said unto him, We neither received letters out of Judea concerning thee, neither any of the brethren that came showed or spake any harm of thee. But we desired to hear of thee what thou thinkest, for as concerning this sect... We know that everywhere it is spoken against. When they had appointed him a day, there came many to him unto his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets, from morning till evening. And some believed the things which were spoken, and some believed not. I'm going to stop there. Number one, the model for the gospel delivery has not changed one bit. Bringing people together, I'm going to tell them about the Lord. Neither does the results. Has the results changed a whole lot, have they? Some believed, some did not. I want to tell you, from the very beginning to the very end, it didn't matter, it was always the same. Some believed, some didn't, but always preaching the gospel. That was the model all the way through. And I'm thankful for that. Notice, we go on. And uh, they agreed not among themselves, verse 25. They departed after that Paul had spoken one word. Here's what Paul said. Now, the fact is they went, they were listening to him. This is great. This is fine. We don't know if we believe, but that's okay. And then Paul said something that made them turn off. And it's the same thing he'd always told them. Look, it says there, verse number 26, excuse me, 25. Well spake the Holy Ghost by the prophet, Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers. So he's obviously referencing the Old Testament, Isaiah. Verse 26, go unto this people and say, hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see and not perceive. For the heart of this people is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, 
and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and should be converted, and I should heal them. Be it known, therefore, Paul is speaking now unto you, that salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and that they will hear it. When he had said these things, the Jews departed and had great reasoning among themselves. I want to tell you right now, this was the last message that Paul records to his people, the Jews. He still had a heart for his people. He still wanted them to believe. And if those in, in, in Rome would come before him, he would tell them again what God was doing in his plan. And that's exactly what he did. He said, listen, guys, I want you to get together. And I want to tell you what God's doing. And they heard him. This is interesting. I believe Jesus. I believe this. But then when he began to say this, the prophet Isaiah, oh, you have it back. Good for you. All right. Well, we'll hold on to that in a minute. So the prophet Isaiah said, listen, they will have ears to hear. They will have eyes to see. They can see it. They can hear it, but they're going to close their eyes and they're not going to hear what I'm going to say. And so Paul says, I'm sorry, but that's what the Bible says. But the Gentiles, they will hear. They'll receive it. How many think that made the Jews very happy? Yeah, they're like, oh, this guy's nuts. Now, I don't think the ones that believed were discouraged. Maybe they were. I don't know. But the fact is, that message was very controversial. And that's exactly, Paul didn't change his tune one bit. And I'm grateful for that. Now, let me give you a couple thoughts here before we close. Obviously, now you can see some of the things there. Thank you, Brother Ethan. So you could see, I don't know, just by way of, of the um, geography coming up here to Rome, you could see kind of where they stopped in some of these places. And um, anyway, you get the point there. Okay, so. Let me just give you a couple thoughts now. Here's Rome. Look at the last two verses. They cover a whole bunch of time in two verses. Ready? The Bible says in verse 30, Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house. It's pretty interesting, huh? Noah go, notices and, and received all that came in unto him. Who came in unto him? Well, the Bible tells us here who came to Paul while he was in Rome. I've got a list here, and I, I hope it doesn't overwhelm you. I don't have all the verses. I have all the verses. I'm not going to give them to you. Uh, but Timothy was with him, right? John Mark had come to see him. Luke was there with him. Aristarchus came to see him. Epaphras came to see him. Justice came to see him. Demas was there, although later Demas would forsake him. He met with the runaway of Philemon by the name of Onesimus, led Onesimus to the Lord in prison, sent Onesimus back to his owner with a letter of recommendation, restoring him not as a slave, but as a son. It's an amazing story of salvation, but all that happened right there. Then there was another one named Epaphroditus who brought a gift from the Philippian church. And Epaphroditus was the one that got deathly ill while he was there ministering to Paul. And Paul began to tell them about it. They said, listen, Epaphroditus is very sick and we need to pray for him. God raised him up. Praise the Lord. But uh, that was a very, very t trying time for Epaphroditus when he came there. Tychicus was a man who was known as Paul's mailman because he took the, the letters of Philippians and Colossians and Philemon's, uh, Philemon and delivered them to the people who they were supposed to go to. So Tychicus came, and Paul tells us about Tychicus there. And it's very interesting to me, all these people that would come and see him in this first time in Rome that he was. Now, here's the question. What happened to Paul? It's like a mystery or a, 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 a book that we're reading and we get to the end and it doesn't close it out. That's, the off, that's awful, right? I mean, we'd be, I'd be writing the author. I'd be calling him. Come on, what are you doing, right? And I think that's kind of the way we feel with Paul. We followed him now through all of these adventures and damp, d difficulties and dangers and all the things that have just caused so much hurt and heartache and victory and all of these things, we're just like rooting for Paul, and all of a sudden it just cuts off. We don't know. Now, I'm going to deal with this real quick, because I think it's very important why Ro or, uh, uh, Acts ends the way it does. Acts, I believe, ends the way it does because, can I tell you this, it's never been about the Apostle Paul. It's never been about Peter. Now, they were the main characters in, often in these, in these stories, but let me tell you, it's always, and if you go back and listen to our first couple messages in Acts chapter 1 and 2, it's always been about the advance of the gospel. It's always been a documentary of the advance of the gospel from Jerusalem going out into the known world. And let me tell you, that's why we don't hear from the Apostle Paul how, he ended, how it ended. 
Now, there's some tradition. There's some things I'm going to tell you about before we end. But let me tell you, the Bible is not a history book. The Bible is not a biography book. The Bible is not a science book where it talks about geography and science and history. It's very accurate. Everything's exactly where it was and how it was. There's no doubt about it. But it wasn't a book of biography about the Apostle Paul. I know we end up saying, well, how did Paul die? Can I tell you, it didn't really matter. You know why? Because Paul himself said, long ago, really it wasn't about Paul's death. I think all of Paul's life was death. Remember, he says, I die daily. He said, I, I'm sacrificing myself. I take up my cross daily. It's not about his physical death. It's not even about how he died. It's not about even about death. Because for Paul, Paul said, listen, I, I'm now ready to be offered. Remember, he said that. He, he said in the book of 2 Timothy, he said, now this is at a different time, and I'll explain this, but he said, I've run my course. I've completed. I've kept the faith, and I'm ready to go. Now, I don't think that was when Paul, right now, Paul was writing that, and I'll explain that, but his mentality was, death is not important to me. Can I tell you right now, church, if death is your focus, and I know as a human, that's very real. That's very natural. But if you obsess about death or dying, and I mean by that, that's in your mind, can I tell you, I don't think you're taking full advantage of the grace that God's given to you through salvation to deliver you from that fear of death. Because Paul says, listen, he wrote this. He said, oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where's, where's thy victory? Right? So what I'm saying tonight is it's not about Paul's death. It's about the advance of the gospel. And, and, and Luke, Dr. Luke took us right up to the end uh, where we see it arriving in Rome, doing exactly what God had promised to do. Now, it doesn't end there because I believe Paul in his later uh, epistles. Now, by the way, he wrote uh, while he was in prison or in, in uh, house arrest this first time. He wrote the book of Philippians. He wrote the book of Ephesians. He wrote the book of Colossians. He wrote the book of Philemon. All right. This time. But it speaks of later ministry. So here's what I believe could have happened and probably did happen. I believe that Paul went here to go on trial before Caesar, but after two years, it kind of was in limbo. There was nothing going on. So the scenario could really play out two ways. Number one, he had a trial and he was acquitted and released. Number two, it never came to trial. And therefore, he was released and had further ministry. Either way, what I believe happened was Paul did not die in Rome right then. Now, I'm not speaking heresy here. Follow with me. He did die in Rome, but it wasn't this time. Because the Bible speaks of, and Paul himself speaks of, a later ministry in the West, which I believe is Spain. It talks about ministry in the Aegean Sea area. And I believe even as he wrote First and Second Timothy, which are his last epistles that he wrote, and Romans, that Paul was looking forward to being released from Rome. He said, when I'm released, when I'm, I'm going to come to you. That was his expectation. I think he knew what was going to happen. He didn't have a case. Remember, you know, even, even uh, Agrippa and Felix and Festus, they couldn't really come up with a, a case against him. So they sent him because he was requested to go, but they really didn't have a case. I believe what happened was Paul was not tried in Rome right now. He was stayed there for two years under house arrest, ultimately released. He had later ministry. He was able to go out. And in 67 AD or 68 AD, he was arrested again probably because of the, uh, the Jews that were causing trouble, though we don't have record of this in the Bible. But we do know he was arrested in 67 or 68. He was uh, taken back to Rome, and this time it was completely different. Now when he was arrested, he was treated as truly a, a prisoner, and he was thrown into what was known as the Mamertine Prison. And that Mamertine prison was something that was very, a, a terrible place to be. And, and actually in Rome, you could go and visit the prison where Paul, uh, or it was a Mamertine visit, uh, prison. They believe it's, it may be the one where Paul was. I, we didn't get a chance to while we were there. But the fact is that he was mistreated. He was treated as a prisoner and it was awful. Matter of fact, it was getting cold. And there are things that happened to him that he wrote about in the book of Timothy. Um, he didn't live in a house, but he was rather in a prison, treated like a prisoner, as I mentioned. Winter was coming on. Remember, he told Timothy to bring his cloak, all right? So he, he didn't have his basic needs, what he was needed. It was, it was cold, and he needed that, that cloak. He was the, probably the worst thing that could have happened, happened to him, and that was he was forsaken by the believers in Rome. 
Now, I, I don't mean that they were being, you know, willfully absent. I don't know. But they were not reaching out to him like they were in the past. We get the sense that Paul was alone in this later time. So he, he was released from Rome the first time. Then he was brought back to Rome in 67 or 68. This time it was completely different. And uh, now we know that the Bible says Luke remained with him. Only Luke is with me, he said. He said, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. And we know that the house of Anesiphorus uh, ministered somewhat to his needs, but, but he, he didn't have the believers around him that he knew. He longed for Peter, or excuse me, for uh, uh, Timothy to come, and he longed for John Mark to come again and be with him. And, and his heart was to see them again. But we, we believe then that it was during this time that ultimately he was killed for the gospel's sake. Now, tradition tells us that he was beheaded. We have no really understanding. There's really no way to know. He was a Roman citizen, so we know he wasn't crucified like Peter was. Peter would have been martyred about the same time. Uh, but, but being a Roman citizen, probably he was beheaded as a more humane way of death and uh, as a punishment for his capital crimes against uh, the, Roman, the Roman Empire, according to them. And so, but again, the fact is we, we really don't know we really don't understand uh, where Paul, uh, uh, how he died and all these things. But the fact is, number one, he probably did die, right? And number two, it probably is not that important. Because the important thing is not the man, but the gospel. And the message of the gospel, it's always been important. I praise God for that bright light, Apostle Paul. But ultimately, that light died. Now, his influence goes on, praise the Lord. And, and I, I want to close with this thought that I wrote or that I found it's very, very interesting, and uh, <clears throat> the, the fact of the matter is, um, notice uh, about Paul's martyrdom, and, and here's, what, here's what this commentary said. Paul was a martyr, and one of the most eminent of the martyrs. He was not the first, but he was one of the first, for his very life may be considered as a martyrdom. Remember I said, he, he said, I die daily, right? His whole death, or his whole life was about dying to the Lord all the time. The simple idea of being a martyr is that of bearing a testimony or being a witness. And the word is applied to the martyrs as such because they bore witness to the truth of the gospel in the face of all that was employed to deter them from it. Through suffering, persecution, poverty, sorrow, Paul thus bore faithful testimony to the truth of the gospel. And when the time came for him to seal his faith with his blood, he did not refuse to die. And I would say to those especially who are entering on life with high hopes and brilliant worldly prospects, that they also, if they would renounce all these for Christ, would never repent the decision. No, come poverty, come disappointment, come toil, come care, persecution, reproach, scorn, whatever it is, even death. The Bible says it's in its most fearful form, the time never would arrive when you for one moment, hear me out, would regret that you had taken such a step, living, dying, and forever, you would rejoice that you had been able to give up all for Christ. And I believe tonight that's exactly what Paul's life was lived. Listen, he gave up everything. Remember, his, his resume was very long. He could have had anything. He was wealthy. He was learned. He was educated. He was religious. But he said, I counted all but dung for Christ. And I believe he got to the end of his life and yes, though his life was difficult and it was hard and persecution, he, he got to the end of his life and says, it's been worth it all. That's, that's the Christian life. And I praise the Lord tonight for the fact that we have the truth of God's word. I could go on and say that I believe then that the gospel spread from where Paul was in Spain, ultimately in his latter years, uh, all the way up into Europe then. And that gospel went, as God would allow, up into um, the British Isles, which was, wasn't the British Isles then, uh, but the gospel went up there. And by the way, uh, down into Africa and farther west or east into Asia. And praise the Lord. I believe today that I'm standing here as a saved individual because the Apostle Paul took the gospel and it propagated. Now, it wasn't just him. There was a long line of people. But the fact is, I'm saved because we have uh, the testimony of a faithful Apostle Paul. Now, praise the Lord tonight for a man who was just faithful. But I'm thankful tonight that the book of Acts ended not with a man, but with the gospel. That God shows us what's important there, and I, I thank the Lord for it. So, that was Paul's fourth and final trip to Rome. 
And uh, it's very eventful and, and very interesting. And I'm grateful tonight that we can discuss a little bit of it. Uh, we're going to close, uh, but I just thought maybe for a minute, uh, a little bit informal, but does anybody have any thoughts, maybe questions that have arisen uh, during this time particularly? Anybody at all? If not, that's fine. We're going to close and we'll go to prayer tonight. Uh, but maybe something popped in mind. All right. Oh, Nathan, yeah. Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, I think it's like, uh, like at home when we put wood on the fire, sometimes we see creepy crawlies coming out of the wood. I think it just was probably having a house in the wood and it was in the fire and when the fire came the heat was on and it wanted to get out and Paul ha Paul's hand happened to be there so he grabbed onto it. I'm, that's what I'm guessing. Yeah. See? It's interesting, yeah. God allowed him to get in with some of those, like for instance on the island of Malta, it wasn't just staying around the common people, he was with Publius, right? He was the one who was the main guy there. Interesting. Praise the Lord. Good. All right. Very good. I see no others. Let's pray and ask the Lord's blessing as we close. Lord,